Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, my name is Sally Sattel. I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. And I have a feeling that many of you are already fans of, of Rob Henderson's and kind of know the trajectory of his life. But I'm still going to go through the broad outlines. And then he and my colleague, Naomi Schaefer Riley, who's a child welfare expert here at AEI, will, will fill, in the, fill in the wisdom of, through that outline. Um, all the wisdom that you extracted from a very, very challenging upbringing. So Rob's mother struggled with addiction, and, he was, and she was deported back to South Korea when he was three years old, and he never saw her again. Uh, he spent the next four years in 10 different foster homes in Los Angeles, and at age seven, he was adopted and settled into a lower, um, lower class home in Red Bluff, um, California, which seems stable and he had a, a dad uh, for the, really the first time. But that stability, unfortunately, was shattered two years later when those parents divorced. And after that was a, a series of um, poor performance in school, a lot of vandalization with um, uh, friends um, who were, unfortunately, and often in the same position he was, uh, coming from unstable families. A lot of weed, a lot of fights, a lot of alcohol. Um, but Rob was a reader, and he was curious. And during his senior year in high school, a history teacher who had been in the Air Force himself encouraged Rob to enlist. That teacher saw potential that, according to Rob, he hadn't, quote, yet discovered or maybe didn't even want to. So he was in the Air Force for eight years. He enrolled at age 17. Through the GI Bill, he went to Yale to study psychology. I'm the psychiatrist. He studied psychology and um, made many astute um, social observations there and inspired his, uh, I, I guess, your tagline, which is luxury beliefs. And you can, you can talk more about that with um, Naomi. But basically, I, I particularly recommend chapters 10 and 11, which are his really trenchant observations of, of life in, a, in an Ivy League university. And everyone, um, if there are not enough books, just come up and let me know afterwards, and we can, we can order some more. Anyway, he graduated Yale in 2018 and, um, at, at 28, and then went on to uh, Cambridge in England to study psychology, where he just received his PhD. Now he's 33, and looking back, Rob writes in his book, until I was 17 years old, nearly everything in my life was propelling me to a life as one of America's lost boys. The young men who fail to mature, who do poorly in school, live on the economic margins, and become absentee fathers, or fail to form stable families of their own. How did he diverge from that path? And what are the indispensable insights that he gleaned from his combination of hardship, intellect, and temperament? Well, that's what we're here to, to hear more about. And um, again, thank you so much for coming. Looking forward to it. Um, so uh, Sally's given everyone the timeline, and I guess I just want to start back, you know, maybe I'll put you on the couch, um, and ask you about your earliest memories, but particularly thinking about uh, your time in foster care, um, what do you think was uh, going wrong in those families, the early families that you were in, um, and, and how did that, uh, you know, sort of looking back, what do you, what do you make of those, that, that dysfunction? Well, so my, you know, my, my birth mother and I, you know, she was just not in a position to care for me due to her addiction. Um, never met my father. Um, you know, I, I write in the book, you know, I, I received this very thick document, you know, full, full of information from social workers and forensic psychologists and people who were involved in my case when I was in the system in Los Angeles. And... You know, in, in, in these reports, uh, they indicate that some police officers and others, you know, they asked my mother, you know, where's this boy's father? Because you're not in a position to care for him. And she didn't even know who he was. Um, you know, she claimed that his name was Robert, which is where I got my, my first name. Um, and it wasn't until last year. So last year I took a, a 23andMe genetic ancestry test and I went my whole life not knowing this about myself, but I'm half Hispanic on my father's side. Um, and that's basically all I know about that part of my family. 
Um, then later in the foster system, you know, there was a lot of, I mean, it's, it's overburdened, it's overstressed. LA, I just recently read that LA might be the, the worst sort of foster system in the country, um, simply because there's this surplus of children who need homes and very few families who are able to, or willing to take them in. And so I rem and this was in the 90s, so you know, if anything, things have probably gotten worse. I just read this report in NPR that the number of foster children, or children in foster care since 2000 has doubled. Um, a lot of this is due to the opioid crisis and drugs and um, the effects of that. So in the 90s, at least, you know, I still remember some of these homes having eight to 10 kids living in them. Um, as some of these homes, I remember there would be two bunk beds in a bedroom, and so there'd be four kids to each room, so two kids on the top and two kids on the bottom. And, you know, when you have that many kids around and the constant sort of turnover where kids would constantly, constantly be coming and going, you know, foster parents just, they don't supply adequate care. Even in the best of circumstances, when you have 10 kids, you can't necessarily, you know, supply as much care as each kid needs. But then in that sort of continual instability and, and turnover rate, it's, it's basically impossible. And so, yeah, I just remember a lot of squalor, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of um, just like grime and dirt. And yeah, it was uh, really, really unpleasant. And the tacit agreement seems to be that, you know, as long as, as, long as the kids aren't being actively abused or harmed or mistreated, that you know, the people and the social workers and the people involved will kind of look the other way because it's better for a kid to be living in those circumstances than to be sleeping on the street, um, which is probably true. But these, you know, the system is, is just severely broken. And I document some of those experiences in the book. So um, a lot of people who go through this kind of foster care experience, um, uh, you know, tend to think things might have been better had they stayed with their biological family. Um, you make a point of saying you never went to, I mean, obviously your mother was deported and you weren't really sure who your father was, but you never made a point of sort of trying to go seek out relatives in any way. Um, why was that? And, and you also make a point about the, um, the other kids who you were in foster homes with who were sort of constantly going back and forth between their biological families and their foster families. So, um, you know, why don't you feel like you had that desire to go seek this, um, seek out your biological family? Uh, I, I note in the book that, you know, once I became old enough for that to be a question that I could seriously contemplate, I you know, very quickly arrived at the conclusion that, you know, my birth parents clearly didn't want me in their life. And so why would I want to seek them out and form a connection um, with those people? And, you know, I, I write about my adoptive family after I was, after I left the foster system and a lot of the difficulties and imperfections and mistakes and catastrophes, but they chose me and I feel, you know, I still feel connected to them in that way as a result of that. And so, you know, I feel like that, that's my family um, for all of the blunders and everything that I write about in the book, uh, I feel connected to them. And I, even if I were to meet my birth parents, I don't think I would feel connected in that same way. Um, and then just to go back to that point about the dysfunction of the foster system. So there was never any possibility of me being reunited with my family of origin because my mother was, you know, she left the country. No one knew who my father was. There was no extended family member in the U.S at least to the knowledge of the social workers in, involved in my case. And yet I still spent just shy of five years in the system uh, living in, so in LA it was seven different foster homes um, in Los Angeles. And essentially, you know, the reason I ended up in the adoption system in the first place was because uh, at some point I was required to see a, a, a psychiatrist. Um, and this doctor looked through my report and recognized that, oh, this kid isn't going to be reunited with his family of origin. And he recommended that I be put up for adoption as soon as possible. But someone should have recognized this earlier. Someone should have recognized this when I was three years old and immediately put me into the adoption system. Uh, but instead, there was just this, I was in this sort of holding pattern of going to different homes all of the time um, until someone finally took the time and actually carefully read my report. Um, and this is just, you know, I basically got lost in this vast bureaucratic system, and this is happening to a lot of kids. 
Um, so after you were adopted, this was the, the first time that you had this real father figure in your life. Can you describe sort of what was different about that? I mean, throughout the book, you make a lot of, you know, sort of the fact that um, uh, when you got to Yale, you know, the, the kids there come from two-parent families. And so for a few years of your life, you had this stable two-parent family. Um, talk, talk a little bit about the family and particularly about the relationship that you had with your father then. So right uh, after I was, I was adopted um, just before my eighth birthday, I remember being uh, very just full of joy, uh, having a family. Um, at one point, so when I was still in the final foster home I lived in, my foster parents came to, or, or my adoptive parents came to visit me, the Henderson family, and I called my, who became, the person who became my adoptive mother, Mrs. Henderson, and she said, oh, you, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable with it, you can just call me mom. And I remember like, oh, you know, this is, that, that's how I sort of recognized that something was different about this family and that I really was going to be in a, you know, a permanent placement. And so for a little over a year, uh, I did have this stable family, uh, this, this working class family in this kind of dusty blue collar town in Northern California um, called Red Bluff. My adoptive father was a truck driver. My adoptive mother was an assistant social worker. She'd had some other jobs too, but um, that's the job she settled on when, when I was adopted. And you know, they, they paid the bills, they made ends meet. We had a family, we had family dinners. It was just like a the kind of family I would see on TV or in the movies of like a mom and a dad and I had an adoptive sister who was their birth daughter. Um, and then they divorced um, about a year later after the adoption. And my adoptive father was, you know, he was angry at my adoptive mother for leaving him and he retaliated by cutting off contact with me. Um, and this was really, you know, his, it was really hard for me, you know, after never knowing my birth father and then all of the foster homes and then, and then losing my adoptive father. Um, and, you know, I was, I was nine years old by this point and my, you know, so my mother got full custody of me. We settled in this kind of gloomy duplex uh, in town and she was working full time and she was doing her best to pay the bills and make ends meet. But her attention was um, taken up by those tasks and I was kind of this latchkey kid and I'd get into a lot of trouble and get into mischief with my friends and you know, a lot of other kids in this neighborhood. I mean, this is, this is interesting, you know, the other scholars since then I've learned, you know, the, the research and the kind of changing deterioration of the family in these communities. So I was adopted in the late 90s and I kind of got this front row seat into what's happening in sort of working class, lower middle class areas of the country. Um, where, you know, I had other friends growing up in this town and they were raised by single moms. I had one friend raised by a single dad. I had one friend raised by his grandmother because his mom was on drugs and his dad was in prison. And that's a very common picture now of what these families look like. And so these were the friends I had and they also had parents who were distracted or busy or neglectful and we would do all of the things that, that you know, Sally had mentioned, and vandalism and drug use. And I mean, I drank beer for the first time when I was five in one of the foster homes. And then I started to drink tequila when I was nine and smoking weed and cigarettes and then on to harder drugs later. Um, and that's not, not an uncommon path for a young boy in, in those, those circumstances. Um, so throughout this period, you're, you're in school and there seem to be sort of good years and bad years. And there are years where, you know, your love of reading and, you know, your, your desire to succeed at this sort of seems to kind of push you along. And then there are years where you kind of give up and decide that this is, you know, that there's no way you can win at this. Um, can you describe kind of the role that schooling played in your in this period? I mean, you, you were kind of leading these two parallel lives, you know, whatever was going on at home and whatever was going on at school. Um, but in the book, you sort of make the point that um, a lot of people focus on education as the thing that's going to save, um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, struggling kids from lower classes. Um, and you say that you don't think that that's necessarily going to happen, but it sort of seems to have worked out in some ways for you. So, um, you know, just what, what role do you think education can play in helping kids like you? No, I'm, I'm, 
thankful for the direction of my life and the academic successes that I've had. Um, but I don't think it's the end all and be all. I'm, you know, when I think back to the friends that I had growing up, I was the only one of my friends who did go off to college eventually, you know, after eight years in the military and sort of figuring out how to redirect my life trajectory. But I had five friends who never went. And, you know, when I think back to, you know, those years and the kinds of students we were, I don't, I don't know if even if you place them in the best environment possible that they were necessarily academically inclined. Um, but, I, but I did have two friends who went to prison. I had one friend who was shot to death. And I think that if they had been raised in different environments, different families, different values, different norms, that they wouldn't have been incarcerated. Maybe they wouldn't have gone to college, but they probably wouldn't have been incarcerated. And I think there's maybe not so much we can do to sort of raise the ceiling as far as potential, but I do think there's a lot we can do to sort of raise the floor as far as how far down these kids drop. Um, and yeah, my own experiences, I mean, you can read about in the book all of the reversals where anytime there was stability at home, my grades would improve and I would academically excel. And you know, when I was in the foster homes, I was doing very poorly. I was changing schools every three to six months. And at one point, they thought that I had a learning disability because my grades were so poor. And, um, you know, in hindsight, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to think that, you know, you have this boy who's being relocated and changing homes and schools every few months, and he's not doing well. And the idea, you know, the, the next step is to attach a label to him, learning disability, medicalize his problem, and not really look too deeply into the underlying conditions. Um, and then, yeah, once I was adopted and I had that family that I had mentioned for the first year or so, um, you know, my academic performance increased a lot. And then the divorce, my academic performance dropped. And so I was very responsive to how much oversight and stability and containment I had at home. Uh, but by the time I graduated high school, I had a 2.2 GPA um, and was in the bottom third of my class. I was just not in a position to apply for college by that point. But this question of can education help everyone, you know, I... One of the strongest predictors of academic uh, achievement is coming from a two-parent family. And so that's something we could focus on. If we want more kids to excel and do well in school, we could look at what's going on at home. Um, there's a lot of focus on the schooling system and what we could do to improve it. And you know, there's probably improvements that could be made. But the schools I went to weren't horrible. They were, you know, they were public schools. They weren't great, but they weren't bad. The teachers were OK. But what was going, what was, the issue for me was what was going on in the family and in the home, and it was the same for my friends and I, uh, for them too. And so I just saw this study. Um, some, I think it was an economist at Harvard who found that there are roughly 25,000 kids uh, in the country from lower to middle income homes who could qualify for admission into what, you know, an Ivy or an Ivy Plus college. And, you know, I read that study and I thought that's probably right. A lot of these kids would be able to go, but they're being overlooked for various reasons and there are obstacles in their path. But that's only 25,000 kids. There are millions of kids in this country who, again, like they wouldn't necessarily qualify for admission to some very expensive, prestigious university. But they could still, we could still find ways to improve their early life circumstances and ensure that they have a safe, secure, warm, loving childhood. Um, even if we got every single one of those kids to get fancy degrees from an elite school, that wouldn't necessarily make up for those difficult early life experiences. And I think for a lot of people, and I've spoken with other people who've had similar experiences to me and have had achieved some form of upward mobility, that you know it doesn't make up for it. It's not a. It's not worth the trade. Um, that it's essentially that that having a a more conventional upbringing is, is actually more valuable than, than the kinds of success and achievement that we tend to focus so much on in society. And I think part of the reason why we focus so much on those things is because that's what, those are the, so people who set educational policy tend to be college graduates who are really good at school and they don't think so much about the fortunate family lives that they had. I have this line in the book that I've met rich people who have attempted to um, you know, to, to envision what it would be like to be poor, uh, to not have money. But I've never met anyone who's tried to imagine what it would be like to grow up without their family. Um, it's so 
uh, much a part of your life. It's the water you swim and you don't even think about it. But when you don't have that, um, college is just not a, a priority for those kids. You know, if you tell a kid who's living in mired in dysfunction and deprivation and so on, and you say, well, someday you're going to go to Harvard, I don't think they're going to be excited about that. I think they're going to say, well, I wish I knew where my dad was, or I wish you know, that you know, my mom wasn't on drugs, or I wish that I felt safer at home and that some, there was an adult somewhere out there who cared about me. I wanted to, I'm really interested in this point you're making about raising the floor instead of the ceiling. Um, and I wonder if you could sort of talk maybe a little bit more about the, the leaders, um, you know, and maybe this is sort of a point you make a lot about kind of the elite bubble that a lot of people are living in, um, that they assume, you know, college education is the best thing for everyone and that it's something that's going to fix all of a kid's problems. Um, can you sort of talk more about that, that I, this idea of raising the floor? Like, what, what would that look like? Um, maybe it's, it's just about family stability, but are there other things that you think we could be doing, um, you know, to improve the floor for a lot of kids while instead of focusing on the 25,000 kids who could be getting into, you know, Ivy League schools but are not? Yeah, I, I, there's, I mean, I'm sure there are sort of economic solutions to this. There are ways to... You know, twist the dials of certain economic policies to make sure that families can stay together and provide and take care of their kids. But I, there's also, I think, a cultural piece here, too. Um, you know, the kind of messaging that we receive from media and pop culture and all these kinds of things, I think those could also play a role in cultivating and promoting stable family structures and Shifting, I mean, there's, there's just so much, like, like right now it's really interesting, at least among the sort of the elite and the chattering class, this preoccupation with polyamory and open marriages. And I think those things can be fun pastimes for you if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're well-resourced and upper middle class and, you know, you're a kind of cognitively atypical person. But for most people, uh, with children, Two-parent family is the way to go uh, if you want to maximize the statistical odds of that kid succeeding or at least not catastrophically failing. Um, and so I think, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of cultural messaging plays a role as well here. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a person in an upper middle class neighborhood and your parents are married and all of your neighbors are married and your friends, their parents are married and that's the kind of water that you're swimming in. But, and then you turn on the TV or you open a magazine or listen to some music or you know, the pop culture, you know, they're showing you images of novel relationship arrangements and infidelity and all these kinds of things. Like, you, know, you still have the models in front of you for what a healthy relationship looks like, um, even if you're getting all this other stuff from, from outside sources. But if you're a kid in a poor working class community and you are raised by an unmarried parent, you don't know your mother or your father, all of your friends are in similar circumstances. Everywhere you turn in your personal life, you've never actually seen what a functional, healthy marriage looks like. And then you turn on TV or open a magazine or listen to music and pop culture and it's polyamory and open marriage and this, that, and the other. Like you're not getting good information anywhere about how to have a committed, normal, monogamous relationship. Um, and so it's, it's no surprise that, you know, for those communities that lack the guardrails, things continue to spiral out of control. Um, so let's talk about drugs. I mean, obviously you had this situation, the reason why you went into the foster care system in the first place. You talked about, you know, your, the early years when you started drinking and using drugs. Um, and then, you know, after you were in the military for a while, you, you know, finally sort of confronted these problems. Um, can you sort of talk a little bit about more your journey, but also kind of where you see our culture in drugs and, um, you know, what what your concerns are and also, um, you know, whether in terms of our both uh, laws, but also sort of cultural attitudes. And maybe we can get into the luxury belief question, too. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, just recent, you know, it's everywhere you turn in a major city, it's like you smell marijuana just everywhere now. And I remember the line when I was like a teenager, it was like, oh, it's natural, it's not as bad as alcohol. And I think 
I, I mean, now it's, uh, you know, people are creating these strains and it's much stronger than it used to be. I mean, even, even 15 or 20 years ago, I, my understanding is like weed has gotten very potent. Um, and then there's like dabs and there's like all these different ways to um, take drugs now uh, and, and weed. And I think, yeah, it can, again, it can be fun for you if, uh, if most of your life is stable and predictable and secure and so on. But when you have access to drugs and you don't have that stability in place and you don't have good role models around you, your life can quickly spiral out of control. And so, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, what do we do when we were nine? Yeah, we, it was pretty easy to get cigarettes. And then later we'd get cold medicine. And then I, later California introduced a law that you could only buy like a certain amount of dextromethorphan and certain kinds of medication over the counter uh, because people were abusing it. Um, but it was still like, it was hard. There was like friction. Anytime we wanted to get something, it was like you had to <laughs> overcome these obstacles to get good drugs. Um, but if all drugs were legal all the time, you know, I could imagine my friends and I at 15 or 16 years old, just very quickly, you know, like a fentanyl was around, I mean, probably is around now in Red Bluff, but, you know, in the mid-2000s, if it was around and freely available, you know, probably not all of us would have made it um, today. So, yeah, I think drug, like legalizing hard drugs is, you know, I would, I would classify it as a luxury belief. I just read this article in The Atlantic about Oregon. You know, they legalized all hard drugs, and now they're having severe issues with people injecting drugs and overdoses and people dying in the streets now. And I think it sounds good on paper, but I mean, even, you know, it doesn't pass the common sense test that if you legalize hard drugs, things will, things will necessarily improve. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I think it's a real mistake. Uh, even, even, even weed, you know, I, I've thought about this, that, you know, young people tell me now that they're basically high 24 seven. And I, I wonder if in the aggregate it will be more harmful than alcohol. Um, you know, if you have, you know, like a, as a thought experiment, if you have 100 people on a highway, one of them is drunk, you know, that's very dangerous. But if you have 100 people on a highway and, I don't know, 30 of them are stoned, like that might be equally dangerous to having one very drunk person. And that's kind of where we're at now, where a lot of people <laughs> are basically stoned 24-7 on weed. And at the individual level, they don't pose the same threat as someone who's drunk, but in the aggregate, when you have 30 people versus that one, I think it could be, you know, posing equal, equal dangers. Um, so for those in the audience who are not familiar, tell us what a luxury belief is and maybe talk a little bit about sort of uh, what happened when you got to Yale. Well, so I arrived at Yale at a weird time uh, in 2015 um, after eight years in the military. Uh, so I was, you know, I was discharged in August, started class in September, and then in October I saw, you know, the Halloween costume controversy as it came to be known, and I was just mystified by it. Um, this idea that, so, you know, I, I don't know if I want to go into the entire specifics, but essentially, you know, that was the sort of the birth of cancel culture and it you know, wasn't quite the birth of wokeness, but I think that was the birth of when what people now call wokeness kind of started to spill out of the universities, where this got like national media attention of students trying to get these professors fired for essentially defending freedom of expression. Um, and so that was a strange experience for me. And then I would you know, interact with the students and learn about them and their views and opinions about family or about, um, about class or about... Um, sex work, and almost all of their views were at odds with what I would hear from people I knew back home or from people I knew when I was enlisted. And not, not every single one of these students, but a disproportionate number of them held these kind of strange views. And so I started to develop this idea of luxury beliefs, which are ideas and opinions that confer status on the affluent while inflicting costs on the lower classes. Uh, and these ideas make, you know, they, they can give the appearance of sophistication and signal one's expensive education and job and social and cultural capital. Um, but once those beliefs are implemented into policy or spread throughout the culture, um, gradually they can have downstream effects for everyone else. I mean, 
I coined the term luxury beliefs in 2019, and I never would have guessed, like, within a year, people would be calling to abolish the police. Um, and then they walked it back, and then it became defund the police, and then they played with what that actually meant, um, and, you know, these, these rhetorical maneuvers. But that was implemented into policy, and, and then in, and in the culture at large, this sort of attitude of suspicion toward law enforcement, and as a consequence, a lot of people were killed as a result. You know, the homicide rate increased, violent crime increased between 2020 and 2022. And those get folded into these like aggregate statistics, you know. In like late 2022, I'd open an article in the Wall Street Journal or something and it would say like year over year homicides have increased X percent since early 2020. And these were sort of snapshot st stats. And then, you know, over the last year or so, uh, the attitude around law enforcement uh, has spilled out, and then there was there was a tech executive who was killed in San Francisco, and he was identified by name in the media and got an article written about him. There were a couple of journalists a few months ago who were killed, I think one in Philadelphia and one in New York City, and also identified by name and had articles written about them. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, so if you're, you know, if you're, uh, the way that I, I interpreted how these cases were treated was if you are just a peasant and you die, you're just a statistic. But if you're a member of the aristocracy, you get identified by name and you get a whole piece about you. And so even if, the, if, even if your luxury beliefs catch up to you, you're still honored and treated in this sort of special way with this high regard of, you know, oh, a member of this upper segment of society was killed and they get, they get treated very differently. Um, and so a core feature of a luxury belief is that uh, the believer is sheltered from the consequences of his or her belief. Sometimes it does catch up, but again, uh, you're treated differently when it does. Yeah. There was this odd uh, was a review of your book in the Washington Post, and I, I thought it sort of contained maybe a misunderstanding of what a luxury mm. belief was. I wonder <clears throat> if you could respond to it. It, it says, um, he argues that the ostensible radicalism of his peers was actually hypocrisy born from self-interest, that privileged undergraduates want the less fortunate to be opioid-addicted, obese, <coughs> single parents, so that they can get ahead and become even wealthier by comparison. Is that is that what you meant? No, I didn't. I didn't say that anywhere. Um, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't. Um, you know, I'm not that cynical. Uh, if, you know, I wouldn't say everyone, but you know, I. It wouldn't surprise me if one to five percent of these students and graduates of these elite universities, maybe they wouldn't think quite in those terms, but they would think, you know, it, it's good to gain every advantage possible, and if there are losers in society, that would be okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, it's not that extreme. I think a lot of the luxury beliefs are supported um, because, you know, pe people want to feel like their heart is in the right place. They want to feel moral. They want to feel good. They want to, and people are good at sort of justifying to themselves why the, these views are appropriate and people are good at finding ways to do the intellectual acrobatics to make themselves support ideas that make them feel good. And so, but there's a duplicity there that I want people to, to focus on, which is, you know, there was a, a study I cite in the book, a stat that only 10% of children born to college educated parents are raised out of wedlock. Uh, but then when you ask people with college degrees, um, is it important for children to be raised by two parents? 75% of them say no. Uh, and so there's this mismatch between what educated people say versus what they do. Um, and it's the same with, with defund the police. You can see that that uh, there was a survey in YouGov in 2020 that found that the highest income Americans were the most in support of defund the police. But then you look at where they live, very safe zip codes. Uh, during the unrest in 2020, a lot of them were hiring private security or off-duty police officers. And you know, for their own personal safety, they like having you know, people who are armed and who can protect them. Um, but for everyone else who rely on police, you know, they, they have a different attitude. So, yeah, I'm not, I would just say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite that cynical. Uh, but, I, but with the caveat that the way that she worded that, maybe she herself, you know, is an insight into her. <laughs> <laughs> um, we sort of skipped over, and I really want to get back to your time in the military, because it was obviously very formative for you. 
Um, you kind of uh, initially maybe even give it a little bit of short trip by saying, you know, as long as you occupy young men from, say, the ages of 18 to 25, they'll inevitably be better off than if you sort of let them, you know, sort of do whatever they wanted. And I'll take that point. But I wonder if you could sort of talk about um, those years and, you know, what they did, uh, you know, to form the person you are today. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I do stand by that. I, I think, like, yeah, if you... <laughs> I mean, essentially, if you just locked up all young men during their late teens and early 20s, like something like 85% of the crime, especially the violent crime, would just vanish. Um, and then if you look at like recidivism rates across time, like, you know, by the late 20s, most, you know, most uh, people don't, you know, they don't continue to commit the same, at least to the same extent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot during those years, sometimes when people you know, if they read those chapters of my book, my teenage years, or I just tell them stories about me and my friends during that time, they'll think, yeah, it's just, it's just so different than what I'm reading here or what you've told me. And people change anyway. I mean, right, I'm, I'm 30. I'm in my 30s now. Like, everyone's different between 17 and, you know. But I was in for eight years, and those were, you know, those are the most formative years of anyone's life, or for most people, right, like 17 to 25 so I enlisted. I was underage still when I enlisted. I had to have my adoptive mom basically sign what was a, like amounted to a permission slip because I was still legally a child, and I left as soon as I could. Um, I was 17 when I graduated and fled um, and got out when I was 25, and that was like a long eight years. I enlisted for four, and then when I was, I was like 21, and then I, you know, the the reason why I re-enlisted was because, you know, they offered to, to station me in Germany and that sounded like a fun adventure. But I also on some level at 21 knew, like, I'm still not mature enough to, like, find my way in the world without these, these, these structure in place. Like, I still needed it. And I needed all eight of those years to, like, finally learn how to be a self-sufficient and functional adult because I didn't, I, I wasn't equipped with those attributes during my upbringing. Um, and so, yeah, I learned discipline, camaraderie, how to, you know, how organizations function, um, teamwork, how to be a good supervisor. So later on when I was, you know, achieved promotions. But then, you know, what, one, one distinction I make in the book is between motivation versus discipline. Um, a lot of people say that you know, if they want to accomplish something, they have to feel motivated or they don't want to do something because they lack the motivation. And one thing I learned when I was enlisted was that motivation is not that important. What's important is self-discipline. Um, very few people are motivated to do very difficult things. It doesn't come naturally to most people. But often what separates successful from unsuccessful people is doing the thing you don't feel motivated to do, but doing it anyway. You know, sort of think about this with like gym routines that maybe you don't want to go to the gym, you're not motivated to go, but the self-discipline is you do it anyway. And then you string enough of those days together and large tasks and projects can become accomplished and you become a different person as a result of that. And so that was something that I learned too, because when <laughs> the military, it's like you have to do all these things that you hate all the time. Um, waking up early, especially early, like making your bed, like every aspect of your life is tightly controlled and it's just tedious and monotonous. And, you know, I glossed over a lot of that in the book. Like, I think I gave a description of kind of what it's like, but if I told you, like, day to day, week to week, you would just be bored to tears. So I just kind of, you know, <laughs> here's kind of what a thing looks like and let's move on because you're going to, you know, lose interest. So, um, and that was important for me, all of it, like every step of that um, and, and learning. And I, and I carried that with me later into college of, oh, you know, in high school, I never wanted to study. And so I just didn't because I didn't have the motivation. And then in college, I also didn't really want to study. But that, by that point, I had cultivated enough self-discipline to do the thing, even though I didn't want to. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have one more question for you. And then we're going to open it up to the audience. So start thinking about your questions. Um, so there are two, at least two, other memoirs that I think your book has been compared to. And I, um, one of them is J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy. And one of them is uh, Tara Westover's book, Educated. Um, and I don't know whether you've read either one of those, but um, they seem to have sort of some thematic similarities. And I wonder kind of what you make of this, because those books, and I hope yours will be too, were hugely popular. Um, and so I think, you know, there definitely seems to be this hunger for people to understand, um, you know, what is going on in the lives of 
um, you know, kids who are growing up in somewhat dysfunctional families and um, lower classes, and you know, kind of what are the things that they're observing now about the world around them that could help them succeed. Um, so I just wanted to see if you had thoughts on you know these other authors and you know what you think um, we're all kind of looking for in these uh, in these books. We'll go a little meta. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've read you know good that I've read both of them. Um, and now people expect me to have read everything now, too. You know, so people follow me on Twitter, read my sub stack, like, you read a lot, and then they'll ask me, have you read this? And I say no, and they're like, you haven't read that? I thought you read that. Um, I read both of them. I enjoy both of them. I thought they were both really good. Um, and they both, yeah, they offer a glimpse into a kind of segment of society that a lot of people don't have much familiarity with, a lot of, especially a lot of highly educated people um, from more sort of affluent or upper middle class backgrounds and yeah I think a lot of people who are interested in policy or improving society or finding ways to lift people up you know it's hard you know it's hard to do that when everyone around you and everyone you interact with and all of your friends in your entire social circle they all seem to be doing very well and Poverty or deprivation or squalor, all these things are kind of abstract to you. And so when you read books and it gives you this sort of deep, immersive feeling of what life is like every day for people in these other communities, and we're looking for, I think, yeah, how, what can we do? Um, and because it's one thing to sort of say, oh, here's this policy, but then how will that actually be implemented in people's lives? Um, you know. That was something that I, I thought a lot about with my book is that I didn't want it to just be this kind of conventional like bootstraps narrative of, oh, I started in this very difficult situation and ended up achieving some kind of success. But I also wanted to focus on what's the sort of modal outcome for a young person, a young guy in particular, who's born and raised in these circumstances. And so I tell the stories of my friends too and where their lives ended up. and how that's kind of the expected outcome uh, for someone like this, and that you can't necessarily replicate what I did for every single person. That's not going to work. Um, but there are ways we can think about how to ensure that you know, young people, young guys who aren't going off to college, and maybe they're not interested or academically inclined, that how can we improve their early life circumstances so that you know, even, if, even if they do end up as adults making mistakes and you know, engaging in self-defeating behaviors that, at the very least, they could have had a better upbringing. Um, towards the end of the book, I write something like, um, you know, even if, even if um, childhood stability had zero effect on a person's outcomes, likelihood of incarceration, graduation rates, future earnings, and so on, it, you know, cultivating and ensuring that a kid is raised in safe and stable circumstances is still worth trying to promote because it's a good in itself. Um, you know, if I show you an infant and say, hey, someday this kid is going to grow up to be a violent criminal, does it matter how the kid is raised right now? Um, and if the answer is yes, then I think we should be thinking more about, about the other, like what happens before age 18 rather than, than what happens after. Thank you. All right, I lied. We're actually going to give Sally a little a uh, couple questions if she wants them, one, one and question. then we're going to go out to the audience. Yes, so. we have a lot of time for questions. Um, so, Rob, obviously you beat the odds. I can't imagine what those odds were. You know, one in X. I don't know, but it was steep. Um, but it's also a really poignant reminder of how many kids don't make it out. And I know you just got your PhD, and you're still figuring out what the next steps are. But when you, you know, in as you've been contemplating what might be in the future, what, what do you think you could do um, uh, as an individual? What might you be able to do? I assume you feel some sense. I, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, and it's not a policy book. But <coughs> I assume you have some kind of affinity for trying to help the younger, Rob, you know, the new generations of Robs. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think as, as individuals, it's tough because we want to transform the entire system and we get bogged down in statistics and sort of snapshot aggregate survey data. But at the individual level, there, I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot we can do to make a difference in people's lives. I mean, when I, you know, as soon as I got out of the Air Force and went to Yale, I started volunteering at New Haven Reads 
tutoring kids from the local community. Um, and New Haven is a very sort of rundown, blue collar town with kids from you know, difficult upbringings. And so I would tutor kids in their literacy skills. Um, I would volunteer to yeah, help, help veterans get into college. There are like, things you can do um, at the individual level, volunteer work and so on. And yeah, now I'm doing talks at foster care organizations and boys and girls clubs and you know, trying to communicate this story and to let, to let the academically inclined kids know that you know, this is a possibility for them. I think you know, these, these stories can help to like, crystallize for kids that you know, there is a path you know, upward, but um, also to remind people that you know, for the kids who, who maybe that path isn't the best one for them, that we could also think about just in the immediate moment, you know, how to think about more resources for foster care or trying to support families so that their kids aren't taken from them and that as well. So. You could also be a drug counselor, honestly, as yeah. part of your repertoire because everything you were saying about how you kind of emerged from your, I'm going to, well, you used the word dysthymia, you know, a low-grade depression and your estrangement from your emotional states and your impulsivity is really what you do in recovery, you know? Um, okay, so ready for, <coughs> ready for yeah. questions? Questions. Right there, back. Wait for the microphone, please. Wendy, Wendy Z. Goldman wrote about the uh, destroyed family life in the wake of the Russian Civil War and the difficult effort to establish social services and to ensure that children weren't feral and running around murdering and stealing. The aftermath of that was the fierce social conservatism of uh, Comrade Stalin. So I'm wondering if past political movements were in part uh, the authoritarianism was a reaction to the destroyed family lives of the prior generation. Hmm. I'm inclined to say, you know, yes or maybe. You know, I'm thinking about, there was this really interesting study. Um, there's a, a psychologist, he's a researcher, Michael Bang Peterson. Um, he was an author on this paper on populism. And one of the conclusions he draws, you know, he, he collected data from the US and I think some European countries as well, looking at support for populism and found that, um, you know, there's this kind of inverse correlation with populism and socioeconomic status. And, uh, you know, he also included other measures like, uh, um, interest in dominance and need for status and those kinds of things. And that's actually inversely correlated with populism. And one of his conclusions that he draws, or this team of researchers draws, that people who are interested in populist solutions of having sort of a strong man leader, um, they feel that their own values aren't reflected in the culture and that they basically just want to elect someone to implement their preferences into society. But they themselves are not that interested in uh, seeking those positions themselves. Whereas the people who are very opposed to populism uh, are interested in, uh, in attaining power and status and dominance, uh, and they don't like the idea of a strong man occupying that seat uh, because they themselves would like to be uh, in a leadership role. Um, but I was reading that paper and I thought, yeah, I think a lot of people feel that um, maybe they have certain values and they don't hold luxury beliefs. They have you know, kind of conventional, moderate, middle of the road views or you know, kind of common sense perspectives, but then they look around their communities and see that it's not at all reflected back at them. Um, they see, yeah, deteriorating families and drug use and people making very poor decisions and people who, a disproportionate number of whom are committing crimes. So the vast majority of poor people don't commit crimes, but, you know, people who, who are criminals are disproportionately poor. And I think people forget that. Um, that most poor people don't like criminals, they don't want crime, but they're the ones who are suffering the most from it. Um, I cite some data in the book that people uh, in the bottom uh, income category in the US are far more likely to be victims of basically every single kind of crime. Um, and so if that's your community and then you know, some strong man appears and says, I'm gonna clean things up for you and impose your values and implement your preferences, I can see how that would be very appealing to people who themselves aren't that interested in getting involved in politics or seeking leadership positions, and they can just sort of outsource that to this figurehead to do it for them 
And that could be, you know, it, so, it sounds similar to, to what you've been describing there with, with, with Stalin. Uh, over here. <clears throat> In my view, perhaps not yours, adversely impacts their ability to fulfill the father role that we think about. I, mean, I myself grew up in a neighborhood that sounds like red block. And but when I think about the jobs that the fathers around me had, they mostly don't exist anymore. They no more factory jobs, lower lower clerical jobs, <coughs> computer, etc. So I'm wondering what your views on that are. <coughs> Um, you know, I, I used to hold that view. My confidence in it has dropped somewhat. I read this book recently, um, The Two-Parent Privilege, Melissa Carney, really good book, just came out um, a few months ago. And she reports some research in parts of the country where there, was, where, where there were fracking booms, where suddenly um, men with low education uh, were able to obtain high-paying jobs, and then the researchers sort of monitored whether marriage rates increased and uh, whether these men became more sort of appealing partners, and the answer was no, like marriage rates didn't increase and that they didn't become um, more appealing partners, at least, you know, if, if you use marriage as, as a proxy for that. And so I think that one of, one of Melissa Carney's points in the book is that this is, you know, there may be an economic piece here, but and, and maybe maybe um, you know jobs are necessary but not sufficient. That there also needs to be a cultural piece too. That yes, maybe these men do need jobs that make them appealing, but there also has to be a culture that champions marriage and promotes it and valorizes the two-parent family for kids. And more and more, we're sort of drifting away from that. So that now, even if you do give people high-paying jobs and money and so forth, but the community has just been sort of wrecked and marriage has not been a part of the culture for so long that, you know, that money alone isn't going to mitigate the issue. Emily? One sec. That's Thank you. Uh, everyone, you should read this book. It's absolutely riveting. You'll read it quickly because you won't be able to put it down. Um, Rob, so you have a PhD in psychology from Cambridge. You know, one would expect you would maybe become a practicing psychologist or seek an academic career. But when you project yourself five or ten years in the future, what do you want to be doing? Hmm. Well, so for a lot of people, uh, you know, they hear psychologist and they think of... Uh, you, know, you mentioned like putting me on the couch. That that's that's the image of people have a psychologist of someone who does clinical work. But the vast majority of uh, people with psychology PhDs uh, have no clinical expertise whatsoever. They study things like social psychology or personality or evolutionary psychology or child development, but they don't do much in the way of you know uh, treating mental health. Um, it's clinical psychologists and and psychiatrists. But for me, I studied. I mean, I, it was sort of an amalgam. I mean, I spent a lot of time just reading in grad school. So it was sort of social, evolutionary, personality. Um, and I, yeah, I, I settled about my, my first year in grad school. I knew that I wasn't going to be an academic because I had seen too much, you know, just the, the direction of academia was really alarming. Um, I describe in detail what happened at Yale. Um, and then I arrived at Cambridge. One of the reasons why I wanted to, to go abroad was because I thought that maybe, you know, oh, like maybe this was an American thing. You know, maybe the, the, like U.S. universities, elite universities here, the Ivy League, like they're plagued with this new wave of political correctness. But maybe I'll get out of here. And I don't know. I just had this image of like these stodgy old Oxbridge dons who just didn't have time for this nonsense. And they have plenty of time for it, it turns out. <laughs> they like it too. I mean, it's not quite, it's probably like five years behind, maybe maybe 10 years behind the US in terms of how bad it is, but it's still, you know, it's still pervasive. Uh, so I saw people, you know, I saw postdocs get fired, early career researchers have their careers jettisoned um, at Cambridge. And 
a lot of it happened behind the scenes. You know, I, what I tell people now is that for every public academic cancellation you see, there are at least five others that you don't hear about. Because most, most people who want to be researchers and scholars, like they're not seeking the limelight. They don't want media attention. They just want to keep their head down, hope the thing blows over, and maybe they can sort of find another little position somewhere else. Um, and that's the, the most common case. But there are a lot of people being fired and a lot of people who have lost their jobs over the last well, 10 years or so. Um, and so I was dead set against an academic career, but then, you know, uh, University of Austin, this new fledgling university in Texas, they approached me. So I have an affiliation there. Um, you know, my, I, I got this, I was approached by Substack to move my, my writing, my newsletter to their platform, and that's been paying the bills. And, you know, so we'll see. I, I, but as far as an academic job goes, I'm, I'm still unimpressed with the legacy institutions. Uh, on the back, right here. You have described the concept of luxury beliefs as imposing costs upon the lower classes in exchange for societal, social benefits to the upper classes. But it increasingly seems like with some things like transgenderism, for instance, the upper classes are you know, very glad to have that done to their kids as well, and that these things are not just things where you know, they're expressing support for them, but not actually practicing them. How do you think that, how does that alter your view of luxury beliefs? Um, well, so the transgender, well, so, so generally, uh, the luxury beliefs, they can inflict costs on the upper classes, but the, 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 you know, the price is lower. Um, they are in a better position to withstand uh, the damage and the costs that would be inflicted. Um, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think about the, the transgender case in particular. I mean, even something like medically, if they were to undergo something like that, they would have the resources to reverse it if they decided later on that it, that it was an error. Um, whereas for some someone who doesn't have much in the way of resources, they decide to undergo some kind of medical operation or some kind of treatment, and then later they decide that maybe this wasn't the right choice for them. They may not be in a position to afford to reverse that choice. Um, I think more broadly too. I mean, even things like 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 drug legalization, as another example. Um, if you're a well-off person and you decide to do a lot of hard drugs, um, you know, if you're like a like a rock star who promotes and glorifies drug use, and then you, and you yourself live that, that lifestyle, you are a millionaire and you can afford doctors and rehab and therapists and all the other things available to you as a result of your own choices. But then a lot of the kids listening to you, uh, they do the same thing and they model the behavior that you're promoting. They're not, they don't have the same access to treatment and care and so forth. So. Um, in the back over there. Uh. I really appreciate your talk and the work you've done. I've been following you on Twitter for a while. Uh, I'm also from a blue collar background who is now in academia um, at the Mercatus Center. And my question to you is, how do you bridge the gap between blue collar work and knowledge work, right? Like it's very foreign to me. My parents run a small business, <coughs> so I see them buy low, sell high. In blue collar work, there's a product, right? But as someone from that background in academia, I struggle still to wrap my head around the idea of the product of knowledge work. So to the academically inclined children that you have tutored in the past, what advice do you give them about the nature of productivity in higher education? Thank you. Hmm. Nature of productivity. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's a different kind of work because I mean, a lot of it is sort of self-motivated in academia. Um, I recognized this early on during my PhD that you really have to be self-driven. I mean, I, I enrolled in my PhD program, I think it was 20, 28. And yeah, if I had enrolled at yeah, 21 or 22 or the usual age when people start PhD, well, not the usual age, but you know, right after college, the typical age that people finish college, um, yeah, I don't know if it would have worked out as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's worth it's worth um, 
you know, one thing that, that just generally benefited me was, was seeking out advice from people who uh, have succeeded in those areas. So, you know, I spoke to a lot of grad students who were slightly ahead of me in the program. I spoke to professors. I, I just like gathering lots of advice just generally across my life, like whether it was in the military or later in college or, or now that I'm doing this sort of independent writing thing on Substack of just like asking people around you, what are their tips? What are their tricks? What are things that they wish they had known? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, at least for me, like one thing I wish I had known when I started my PhD was that the first year, like regardless of how, how prepared you think you are, the first year is just going to be, you're going to be full of self-doubt. You're going to be, you, no, no matter how you're spending your time, you're going to feel like it's wrong somehow that, you know, is this really what I should be doing? What am I supposed to be progressing toward? When am I supposed to have the first paper written? There's just a lot of uncertainty that first year. Um, but if someone had sat me down and told me that, then I would have felt much better. And eventually someone did. Uh, so yeah, I think just spending a lot of time getting advice from different sources, uh, from people who are slightly ahead of you in whatever you're interested in. So oh, right here. Um, so my question has to do with attachment. Um, you lost your mom at three, didn't have a dad, and were in foster care until seven. So it sounds like you would not have had a primary caregiver in that period. And according to attachment theory, John, John Bowlby's work, that would have been a really difficult thing to overcome. And I'm wondering if you, you know, have thought about this and how you did overcome that. Yeah, yeah, I, I've read John Bowlby's work, uh, Harry Harlow too. I'm reading a good book right now called Love at Goon Park um, about Harry Harlow and his work with uh, uh, Reese's Macaque Monkeys and, and then later with, with uh, Human Infants and Attachment Theory. It's really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I write in the book about the difficulty of, of even leaving my mom in the first place that, you know, a lot of it, there's a lot of uh, research and attention paid to, you know, the kind of maternal impulse to care for a child and that sort of attachment, and, and fathers too, of the way that the parent feels toward a newborn, toward a small child. But there's less, I think, less research on, on the other side of that, of just how much, how attached the child feels to their parents and how deeply that connection is, is felt and what happens, you know, after it's severed. And so... Yeah, it was really hard for me uh, to leave my mom, um, and then and then the first foster homes. I think the first two homes I lived in, it was really upsetting that I had to leave them. Uh, and you know, like the body adapts, and I write about the sort of coping response of just kind of being blunted, and and later just sort of disconnecting from all emotions and feelings and. It was, you know, this wasn't like a conscious, deliberate, planned thing. It's just a sort of the body reacts in this almost instinctive way where, you know, shut down to not feel negative emotions. But as a consequence of that, I also shut down from feeling positive emotions. And it took a lot of work to overcome. And, you know, I, I could feel it. You know, I could feel it sometimes, but it was like a, it was sort of submerged. And I had to sort of work really hard to access those feelings later. Um, but, yeah, it's... Um, it takes a lot of work in adulthood to, to overcome. Uh, even more so, you know, there's a lot of focus paid to economic deprivation, but not as much on, on childhood instability. And it's actually instability that predicts detrimental outcomes in adulthood rather than deprivation. And so, yeah, yeah, I think that, that the instability piece needs to be more salient. Right here. Hey, Rob. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, I'm Jared. I do outreach here at AEI. I've been a fan of yours for a good number of years. Uh, have you put any thought into how deviancy and these notions of abnormal families and norms have such cultural power? Because luxury beliefs kind of rests on the idea that the elite um, have a strong pull on how the rest of society orients itself. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've lost DDNC. So I'm just curious how you think that uh, plays in and why people are attracted to those sorts of things. 
why why the uh, the elites are attracted to DVNC or why they the, yeah. the elites, but then everyone else too, right? Because if, oh, if if the luxury <clears throat> beliefs is true, then these poor ideas do hold sway over yeah. even those who are not oh. in the upper class. I mean, it's it's fun. <laughs> Like that's, you know, like like living in a, in a in an environment of complete freedom of no rules, no norms, no con- especially when you're young, and especially when it comes to things like drugs and sex and relationships and, um, yeah, having the, like the feeling that there are no boundaries and no limits can be very, uh, or or transgressing them that even if the boundaries are there but stepping over them can be very thrilling. Um, and so I think this is, you know, this is one reason why once, you know, once once it becomes introduced, it becomes very difficult to walk it back, um, even if people want to, simply because they become so accustomed to having that level of freedom and that level of of excitement or ability to indulge. Um, it did seem like, uh, at least for the kind of upper and upper middle class, they did bounce back. I mean, the divorce rates, even for college educated people. In the 1970s, once no-fault divorce was implemented and the laws liberalized, that divorce actually increased a lot for college-educated people, uh, and marriage rates dropped. But then by the 1980s, they recovered and essentially returned to where they were in the early 1960s. And so it does seem like, uh, at least for people who are well-resourced and educated and so on, that they almost recognized, like, oh, this was fun, but maybe we shouldn't continue doing this. And that there's actually a, sort of, there are better and worse ways to live and raise families. Uh, whereas for the lower classes and people who lack resources and lack education and, uh, you know, or just have a different kind of cognitive and personality profile that they indulge in, yeah, they, they indulge in and, and enjoy the lack of restraint. And even if they recognize that these decisions are bad, it's not enough. I mean, this is a point that I make in the book too, is that knowledge alone isn't enough to make good choices. Um, you know, everyone knows that vegetables are good for you, but you know, most people will still order the fries instead of the side salad. You know, most, everyone knows that smoking is bad for you. Um, and yet, you know, if you go to the doctor and you say that you smoke, because I used to smoke, and you know, every single time the doctor would give me this little mini lecture, and I'm like, Bro, I know smoking's bad. But like, you don't have to tell me. Like, I, every time I buy a pack, it's like it's right there that it's bad for you. But do I care? No. Um, but it's still useful to have it reinforced repeatedly. That actually having the doctor give you that lecture, and every time you buy a pack, there's that warning label. Like in the aggregate, it does actually over time. Like having the norm and the stigma and the shame around smoking, it did have a, an effect um, on people's behavior over time. So now the the number of Americans who smoke has dropped by half since the 1980s. Um, and so, yeah, so introducing stigma and shame and norms and limitations, it can change behavior over time. Start right here. So can, is conscientiousness innate or can it be taught? Because when I think of a stable marriage, I think of pe- two people who can make and keep commitments. Hmm. Um, I think it's, it's both. Um, I think conscientiousness, so unlike intelligence, conscientiousness can respond to incentives. Um, you know, if I, if I introduce penalties and rewards and try to make you smarter, it's not going to work very well. But if I introduce penalties and rewards to get you to, you know, be punctual and respectful and committed and those kinds of things, like people, regardless of their sort of innate level of conscientiousness, will behave in certain ways as a result um, of those incentives and environments and the structure in place. Um, so I think now in this complete, it's not complete, but you know, it's much more sort of the, the attitudes around marriage and relationships are much more liberalized and free than they used to be. That if you're a very high conscientious person, um, that you can make it work. You can still make a marriage and a relationship work. But uh, for people who aren't as conscientious and aren't as sort of um, what thoughtful and considerate and inclined toward commitment and those kinds of things, um, it's much harder. But if you're in an environment where that's the expected behavior and that you're um, praised for engaging in it and 
you know, to some extent, maybe penalized a little bit for deviating from it, that you can actually behave in a different way. So. Uh, over here. Uh, you talked a bunch about you, you, one thing that you can do to uh, reduce crime rates is just lock up all the 17 to 25 year olds. <laughs> um, having been 17 to 25, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you feel about having a more institutionalized system like bringing back the draft or national service? Um, so the countries that have national service, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, they're, they're in countries that are actually uh, under sort of ongoing threat. So like Israel, for example, they have national service, but it's necessary for national security. South Korea as well, they border a country with an insane dictator, and so they have national service. I don't know if you could um, sort of recreate the support and conditions and interest in a country like the US where we're not bordering, I mean, maybe if Canada went crazy and decided to, you know, then we could, <laughs> but, but I think, uh, you know, as of now, um, I don't know if it could work in the same way. Maybe, maybe something other than sort of military service, if it was some other kind of national service, um, Peace Corps or something along those lines, I think it could be helpful, especially for, you know, like one thing that the military does very well is um, you get introduced to people from like a cross section of society, from different parts of the country geographically, across class lines, across um, race and ethnicity, all those kinds of things. Like you just learn about people from very different backgrounds than yourself. And so, you know, I'm not, I guess like in principle, I'm not opposed to something like a national service, but I just don't know, like in terms of like in practicality, in terms of, you know, political support, how much there would be. I think we're going to take uh, the last question. Uh, so the Washington, is this working? Uh, so the Washington Post the article over there says that, says that, like, you know, this isn't really a policy book, which, I mean, it's kind of true, it's a memoir, but do you have, like, any, like, really policy recommendations? Like, you know, what should the government actually do or should, what should other, some other institution do to fix its, like, you know, fatherlessness or not having two parents or anything like that? Mm. Yeah, I'm... Uh... So I brought up smoking earlier, and that was, an, that was a success story of, of actually changing behavior on a mass scale. And I remember, um, you know, when I was a kid, I don't know if these still exist, pro probably not as much, but like every time, every third commercial, it was like an anti-smoking campaign. There were billboards everywhere you turned. Uh, the, the culture and society at large, they were reminding you that this was a very bad thing to do. Um, and then, you know, you... Uh, Signs would say, you know, X, X number of people die each year from lung cancer, secondhand smoke, all this stuff. And I wonder if there, there could be some kind of, like, public awareness campaign for families of, you know, you, it doesn't necessarily have to be something. It doesn't have to focus on, like, the negative of, oh, like, if a kid is raised by a single-parent home, they're X percent more likely to go to prison. Because I could imagine that would, that would upset a lot of people. But you, you, could, <laughs> you could have the, the reverse of that if, if a kid is raised by, a two, you know, two parents, they're they're this percent more likely to go graduate from high school and college and to enter the middle class. You know, like a lot of people here are probably familiar with the success sequence. Um, if that was, you know, I just saw this survey um, which found that uh, like the vast majority of both Democrats and Republicans support uh, teachers um, instructing students on the success sequence. Um, something like 70% of both Democrats and Republicans. So this is not like a, a partisan thing that people across the political aisle think that it's important to teach kids uh, that there were the, the success sequence that if you do these three things, you can avoid poverty, um, graduate high school, obtain a full-time job, and get married before you have kids. And something like 98% of people who follow those three steps do not live in poverty. Um, and that's a bipartisan, <laughs> Uh, there's, there's bipartisan agreement on this. For voters, I think for the elites, there's a mismatch. I think Republican elites would support something like that. I think Democrat elites are more skeptical of it. But for ordinary people, I think like this is something that Republican elites could actually sort of dwell on and focus on, that actually everyone agrees on this. So you know, find ways to, to promote that. 
Well, we really encourage you all to read Rob's book. It is, it is great, and you will definitely not want to put it down. Um, so please thank me, join me in thanking Rob for coming today and read the book. <laughs> <laughs>